So uh, our very first talk is Duke's own Cheyenne Mukherjee, and um, he's going to come up and, and give us our first, first talk. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about modeling 3D shapes. And, um, and as you can see, as you can see, this is joint work with uh, two people. Uh, stay in front of them, OK. This is joint work with uh, several people. Um, and I will, I will start. So I really like this picture. Okay, so this picture is a picture of Darwin's finches. And the reason why this picture is interesting is because previous to Darwin, uh, when people thought about organisms, and this was Linnaeus, and they had the Linnaeal system, there was an idea of platonic ideals. So there was an ideal goose, an ideal ostrich, right? You had all of these ideal animals, right? And what Darwin thought of, because he was thinking a lot about evolution, was variation. He was very interested in variation in organisms rather than the platonic ideal. And if you think about shapes, the classic geometers and the topologists, yeah, that would be great. It's a notebook. I got it. Great. So classically, geometers and topologists have thought about shapes in the same language. They talked about genera, right? And so the real, what I want to highlight is we want to think about variation. And later on, a data set I'm going to show you and talk about are heel bones. Um, the applications I'm going to talk about today are either for biomedical applications. We're going to have a cancer application. And the other ones are going to be really thinking about evolution and shapes. OK, great. Why do some people want to think about shapes? You can say how shapes are similar they are, right? Like heel bones or what have you. And then you can make a distance matrix. And then you can make a tree. And people use this to study is there selection. They ask evolutionary questions. So classically, there have been three, way of thinking, three ways of thinking about shapes. And I'll go through them really quick. So one is something called shape space based on landmarks. The second method is based on diffeomorphisms. And the third method, which we'll focus on a lot, is based upon random fields or excursions of random fields. And I'll show you pictures to make all of these more clear. OK, so back in the day, if you're thinking about shapes, you'd go to the British Museum, and you put down landmarks on the archaeological object that you're looking at, and maybe another one. And you'd say, how similar are these points? Right? And so these are my landmarks. And then I can go through and say, how similar are they? Modular rotations, translations, and scalings. And there's a very classic uh, example of this. So people were not sure that Cromwell's head, which was partly decomposed, was really from Cromwell. And so there was a, it's a little gruesome for this early in the morning, but there was a analysis done <laughs> using these landmarks on Cromwell's um, Skull. And this was done by Carl Pearson. It's a very interesting article. And the IRB of it might not have been approved nowadays. Uh, what we get a lot more now are data sets of meshes, right? So these are 3D meshes. They're very beautiful. And you don't want to turn them into a bunch of points, right? So you really want to think about them completely. And one approach, and uh, this is from my colleagues Ingrid Dubashis and Doug Boyer here, and I've worked with them as well on this approach, is you take these two shapes, have kind of landmarks, put a little point over them, or a little surface, and you try to morph one into the other. right? And you ask, how much energy does it take to morph one to the other? And this is based on diffeomorphism. Now, one thing that you encounter a lot in a lot of shapes is you look at things that may not be diffeomorphic. So these are fruit fly wings. The ones above are normal. The ones down below are mutants. And you see extra lobes. They gain lobes, right? So these are not continuously deformable to each other. So what do the data look like? So if I look at some of these data, what I get are these 3D meshes. And so you get uh, bases, vertices, and edges, right? And this is, for example, a tumor. These are ventricles. This is a brain. If I were to look at it a bit more carefully, 
This is called an off file, and what I have is a collection of points in three space, and I tell you where the vertices, edges, and faces are. So that, these are my data. Okay. So what we're going to talk about for most of this is how do we model shapes without requiring landmarks, and how to do it without diffeomorphisms. Okay? And we're going to do it by looking at summaries of these shapes. We're going to show that these summaries are easy to work with. Uh, they don't lose information, and you can map them back and interpret what's going on in the shape originally. Okay. So there are two of them. The second type I'm going to go over a little bit quickly because of time. But the first um, summary we look at is something called the Euler characteristic. For a mesh, it's vertices minus edges plus faces. Okay. And then what we're going to do, and I'll show you pictures of this, is you, this is a heel bone. I'm taking a plane. I'm looking at the perpendicular to that plane, and I'm going to run it through the mesh and see how the Euler characteristic changes. Okay? And I'm going to do this for many, many, many directions. So this is just a picture. That is a mouse embryo heart. If I were to go some distance in in that direction and look at everything in pink, I could compute its Euler characteristic. And I'll show you how we get this middle picture. And the picture on the far right is just a middle picture integrated and uh, zero mean. OK, great. This is a hand. You'll see it soon. As we move through, this is how the Euler characteristic, which for 2D is vertices minus edges, changes. Right? So this is what you get. You get this thing. And so this was the hand. This was the Euler characteristic curve. And that's a smooth version. Great. I will go through this very quickly. Another summary we use is based on homology. And in the interest of time, we'll go through that super fast. This is just counting how, as, I, as the water goes up, right, what's below, how many connected components I have, and how they change. And this is a summary of it, and it's called a persistence diagram. And if anyone really is interested in it, I can tell you a lot more about it, but we'll go through that quickly in the interest of time. So mathematically, what you're doing is you have a mesh, which is just a set. It's a set of points, OK? And then what I have is I have a direction on the sphere. That's my direction. And what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the mesh, and I'm looking at all the points that if I go in direction v, I'm less than t, right? And that's just mathematically what I showed you with that sweep. And this is called the Euler characteristic transform. If I integrate it and zero mean it, what you get is a nice smooth curve. And the idea there is I've taken a shape, which might be complicated. I've turned it into a bunch of curves. Now I can use very standard methods in functional data analysis is, is, is the argument that we, we can make. So similarly, actually, we might have time for the persistent homology, because it's 9.03 right now. So let me, I think we actually have time. So let me give you a less truncated Introduction to Morse theory. That is a donut with a hole in it. All right? Some people call it a torus. Okay? There are people who want to know how many holes there are, right? or how connected it is. Why? That's a different story. But, so there are three numbers. Uh, one is called Betty Zero. Betty Zero tells you how many connected components there are. Okay? So if, if I had two of these, Betty Zero would be two. I only have one of them. Betty Zero is one. So Betty 1 is how many 1 cycles there are. So what you can see is I could take a yellow piece of string, right, and just kind of move it all around that part of the donut, OK? I could also take this blue string and put it on the inside and move it around, and that string will not retract down to a point, OK? And Betty 2 is how many voids there are. I told you someone took the donut and ate the inside and just left you with the outside, right? The chocolate on the outside, let's say, right? And so there's one void in there, so Betty 2 is 1. Okay. Now, one way you can think about changing of homology is the following. I here have a function, right? It's a 1D function. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about just water rising. It's going up, up, up. And I'm going to look at what's happening down below in, the, in terms of the image. And I'm just counting how many connected components there are right, and how they merge. And again, this is a story about Betty 0. You can say similar things about Betty 1 if you're in higher dimensions. So you have water rising. 
And so at this point, one point forms. So that's called a birth. You go a little bit higher, another point forms. You go a little bit higher, now another point for, forms. And then when you go a little bit higher, these two got merged. And the, the story is the ones that was born earlier dies in that merger. Okay, it's called the, people call it the elder rule. And so if you follow this through, this function gets turned into that picture, which is just telling you when a component was formed or, or born and when it dies, okay? So this is another summary of that function, okay? So previously, let me show you another picture. So previously, what we saw was we had this hand, right? And we got this Euler characteristic curve. You could do the same thing with persistent homology. Instead of a curve, you'd get this diagram object. And you could get it from many, many directions. And so let's go back. So yeah, so you also can get this diagram, OK? Now, one of the things that's interesting is that this idea of counting topological changes, be they uh, changes in the Euler characteristic or be they changes in homology, has a very, very old version in imaging. So, so when people talk about micro CT scans, the way we get these 3D shapes, the standard way of doing that is you take your shape, and let's say this is one way we look at uh, tumors or I mean, many other objects, right? And then you take an x-ray, and you run it, the x-ray through from many, many, many directions, and then you reconstruct the shape, OK? And this is called the radon transform. This is a picture of the radon transform. Now, the radon transform involves an inverse problem, meaning I, have, I give you all these projections, and I have to give you back the original shape, OK? Now, there's no need to read all of that. Um, what, I, what is written there is the most abstract and general form of a statement for which there is an inversion formula. Okay, and this is a result by Pierre Shapira, and you don't really need to understand it in detail, but this is the most general form for which we can say that things are inver invertible. Now the point of that previous slide, and what I was telling you is, these transforms that I told you about, you don't lose information. Right? So you take a shape, you turn it into a bunch of curves without losing information, is what I'm trying to tell you here. Both of these transforms are injective. Now I'll also touch on why you might want to use one in one case and another in another case, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. They're injective if you take all directions. So there's a very simple and interesting question, both theoretically and practically, which we'll get to, is how many directions do you want? Right? So empirically, when we were playing around with 2D shapes, we took 162. And 3D, we used over 700. Right? So one can ask, more theoretically, why why these numbers? Why do you want to think about it this way? And I'll also tell you a very applied and important application of this. So a similar question was studied. So there's a beautiful paper by uh, V.I. Arnold where he said, if I tell you, I have 1D function, if I tell you where the critical points are, can you tell me how many different homological functions have those critical points? How many different functions can't, in a way, smoothly map to each other, right? And he gives a closed form answer to that question, which is amazing. It depends on ordering, so if you try to do this in 2D, the, the approach goes to hell, but, but he does. OK, so now let me give you an answer. And, but before I give you an answer, let me tell you why this is practically relevant. OK, so I told you the way that people do get CT scans is they take x-rays from many, many, many directions, right? And then you do the inversion, you get the shape, OK? What happens if I have a radiation budget? Right? And I'm looking at a bunch of patients, right? And maybe I need to look at them many, many, many times, right? And I don't want to over-radiate this, right? The first time this happened to me, well, I was not being radiated, but I had to think about this, is not because I was working with humans, but because I was working with meerkats. And it turns out that you're not allowed to over-radiate meerkats because the meerkat people get mad at you, right? But, uh, but that, that's a different story. Um, so the question is, if you give me an epsilon like reconstruction error, how many directions and which directions would you want, right? And this is a real applied problem we are working on. So a theory version of this, and I think after this, it, there's much less math. Um, 
is, is the following. I have a family of meshes. Let's say they're in 3D, okay? Because most of my work is done in 3D because the shapes are usually in 3D. I tell you there's a parameter delta which is a lower bound on the curvature at any vertex. So something that looks very much like curvature. And then there's a parameter k delta which tells me that if I effectively, if I sweep in any direction, right, how often can this Euler characteristic curve change? How long do I see a new topological feature? If you can control the two of those, you can actually give a bound on the number of directions you need. And why this is interesting in a way is that I gave you a family of shapes. There are an infinite number of shapes that live here, right? And I can tell you how many directions I need to be able to tell apart any two shapes. So it's like 21 million questions. Okay, now what do you do with this? Okay, so these are two heel bones from different directions. So one thing you can do with it is you can make very exciting pictures like this. So what is this picture? We had 106 heel bones from primates. Some of them were extinct. Some of them were extant. We used this persistent homology transform, and then we measured how similar they were in this distance. And then I did multidimensional scaling to show you this picture down to two directions. And what you see are the things up there, orangutan, gorilla, chimp. These are all great apes. The gibbon is a lesser ape. So this is starting to look like what we believe evolutionarily. Spider is not a spider. It's a spider monkey. Then you have a baboon, a macaque, and beso is an extinct old world monkey. Now, all of those up there are old world monkeys except for the spider monkey. The holler monkey, squirrel is squirrel monkey, are both new world monkeys. And Saki is an extinct new world monkey. So you see the new world monkeys cluster together. And the things up there are lemurs. Right? So you do get some interesting evolutionary ideas. Um, my colleague, Doug Boyer, makes much prettier pictures than me. So this is the same thing plotted in 3D and with the different taxa. Okay. Now, what I wanted to show you is the B, picture B is what we did with our transform. Picture A is what you would get is if you use a classic landmark approach. And picture C is what you get if you use a diffeomorphism-based continuous approach. Now, so this is a point of this picture is I sometimes think of, when I think about evolution of shapes, like broccoli, right? Or, or, or cauliflower, right? Two shapes that are really close to, to each other on the tips, you can do a continuous transformation and you'll get great results. But if you go way down and back up, you start getting extra features, this starts getting a little bit messy. And so the reason actually why these more landmark-based approaches fail is really because of these extremes. Right? If you had things that were very evolutionarily close, they'd actually do better. Okay? So, so that's one application. Um, an application that people might care about more is in uh, medical imaging. So that's a brain. You can section out a, the tumor, and that's a picture of the tumor. And we can ask a question, because we have 92 patients. We have gene expression. These volumetric features are just useless. And we have the topological features, very similar to how I showed you. And these 212 morphometric features are features that oncologists and radiologists agreed to. Right? They're very detailed. There are a bunch of them, and they agreed to them. And we can ask, which of these do the best in explaining variation in disease-free survival and overall survival? So the idea is you're using shapes and regression models. So the first thing I wanted to tell you is that's the resected tumor, and this is the Euler curve you get just by sweeping through in different directions. And you do this for, the, for various slices, and you stack them. Then we use a Gaussian process model. You could have used a deep neural network, whatever you wanted, but we used a Gaussian process model. We have a little, little bumps. And uh, this is just more formally. You get these nice conditional statements. It's very common, very easy. Uh, we do leave one out, actually leave 10% out, and we saw how we did on that set. We looked at three kernels, a linear kernel, a Gaussian kernel, and a heavier-tailed Cauchy kernel. And long story short, what we find is that these shapes do better than the other features. Uh, it does better than gene expression, and the heavy-tailed kernel does the best. Now, 
one can ask why this might be true. Gene expression is very, very unstable. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't work as well. If you had methylation, it would do better. But the thing about things like gene expression and methylation, it's invasive to get them. You have to like get in the brain, right, to get them, whereas imaging is not so evasive, right? So this is, again, one of the reasons why. And this idea of using um, imaging and genomics together is becoming more and more used, and it's called radio genomics. And one question you can ask is, why would the shape or the topology of a tumor tell you anything, right? So there, there are certain things we know. We know, for example, that um, if you have a tumor and it's just broken up a lot, the chances of it getting metastatic go up. So that's a statement about Betty Zero. We know that, uh, I mean, surgeons know that when they resect a breast cancer, right, and if it's true that the breast cancer is a sphere and the middle and the inside is necrotic, that has a very good outcome, typically, right? So that's a statement about Betty 2. So there, there are shape questions, and, and, you know, ultimately these are really questions about the physiology of the tumor and how it's attacking tissues. Okay. So the last topic is we might be interested in what parts of the shape are most important in differentiating two groups, differentiating two classes, right? So this is a notion of variable selection for shapes. And we've been working on this, and we have a method which we think has a, has a cool name, Sinatra. Uh, I did not come up with it. My uh, colleague, he's much cooler than I am, so he came up with it. And, and now th this is what I'll, I'll end with, okay. So let me first give you a picture of the pipeline or what we're trying to do. I have two different species, let's say, or different types, category zero, category one. From that, I'm going to use this filtration, this Euler characteristic, to get uh, summaries. Right? So let's say these are the, the things in solid are the Euler characteristic curves for class one. The dashed lines are the Euler characteristic curves for class two. I find the parts that are most different. Okay, and then what I do is I use the information from those parts to actually invert it and get back the subparts of the shape that correspond to those features. And, uh, and I'll tell you how we do all of that. And we have a pipeline. And if you don't like particular pieces of our pipeline, substitute your own. But we have a pipeline, okay? And so we need a representation of the shape. We need a statistical model, a regression model. We're gonna use a nonlinear one. We need the notion of evidence of a feature, and then we need to project that back to the original shape. And we'll tell you how we do all of those. Well, I already told you about representation. We're gonna use the Euler curves. All right, so our regression model, I already told you what it was. It was a Gaussian process. All right, great, done. All right. We're halfway there. All right. So we're gonna use linear, nonlinear models, and again, from, I do a lot of applied work in uh, statistical genetics, and people who do animal or plant breeding, where they try to predict a trait from the genotype, they find that nonlinear models, smooth nonlinear models for these high dimensional data do quite well. They do better than linear models, they, okay? So that's all this slide is saying. Okay. So I need some notion of evidence. We have them in a way for linear models. They're the effect. What, how big is your beta when you run a regression model, right? So the question is, can you do something similar for nonlinear models? And if you have certain classes of models, you can. And you can do it very similarly. So what you do is you have a nonlinear model. You get a function f that you're fitting. And then you think very carefully about how you can project that back on your data. OK, there, there are certain expansions that let you do that. And you no, get a notion of a beta tilde. Okay? And you can use that beta tilde. Now, next slide. All I'm telling you in this next slide is we do this in a Bayesian way, that it's Bayesian is not so important. What's more important is I can get many, 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 many draws of these betas. And the reason why it's important that I get many, many, many draws of these betas is I'm very interested in understanding the covariance structure of these betas. And you'll see why in three minutes, okay? So um, I have all of these betas. Right? But I know that they're correlated, because in all of these data sets, you have correlated features. Right? So my question is, how do I figure out which of these features are really good or really bad? Right? So if one were to play basketball, right? and if, you know, because Duke doesn't have great basketball players, so we have to go with one from Chapel Hill, 
right? Uh, and so, so let's say, you know, circa bulls, God knows how long ago, right? Let's say you take, get rid of one of the better players and you look at their record, right? That might be the change. It's, you know, get rid of Bill Cartwright, it doesn't change that much. Now, you know, if some guy goes off and decides to play baseball, it might get worse, right? So, um, so, so we, we're using this idea. And the way we use this idea is um, this thing, P, B minus J, condition on beta J, means you take out that, you basically take out that beta J, right? And you look at what the distribution is on the rest of them. And I compare that to marginalizing out that one variable, right? So I'm not taking it out, I'm just integrating it away, and I compare those two, okay? If it's zero, that variable did nothing, okay? And uh, so, so there you go. Now, the last thing we do is we normalize these. Right? And we give it a name, which is relative centrality or rate. Okay? And then you know, under the null model, if it didn't do anything, or none of them do anything, it'll all be 1 over p. Okay, great. So now I told you how I get evidence. So the last thing is, now that I know one of these features are important, how do I go back from this transform space to my original space, which is a 3D coordinate on the shape? OK, so which is what I'm saying right there. So in a very long paper, which is painful mathematically, we, we, we realize something really, really simple, which is if you're looking at these shapes and you're looking at what the Euler characteristic curve looks in one direction, if I, show, if I look at a tiny cone right nearby it, they're linearly related. And so what this entire approach is doing, it's taking a shape, it's thinking about the sphere, it's chunking up the sphere into parts, and each part has linear relations, okay? And so you can actually use this entire process to invert the shape. So you pick a cone of a set of directions, and then you just basically do some projective geometry. So let me just show you. This is a tooth. I look at directions really nearby. These are my, this is my cone. And each of these directions, it's, it's showing you where your, those critical points are changing. Right? So you can actually compute that using projective geometry. And that green dot is just a union of all of those. So that's what we do to project them back. And um, OK, let's see. I don't have that many slides, so I think we're OK. So I'll show you how we do simulations, and I'll show you results on real data. That we'll call it a day. So how do you do simulations for shape and be able to control things? That was not obvious to us, right? So we actually used a caricaturing approach that they use in computer graphics. So this is the original shape, and then you can grow it however you want. Right, by caricaturing it. So this is the class for shape one, this is for the class for shape two. Basically, you're just taking these teeth and you're playing around with uh, the little bumps on them. And then you can ask what parts are different, and then you can see them. Right? Seeing is one thing. You can also try to make true positives versus false positives and ROC curves, which you know, some people like because it's a bit more quantitative than looking at them. But you know, teach their own. Um, now, for a real data set, we didn't work with the tumors just because we didn't really know what ground truth would be. So, um, so <laughs> we had a lot of molars. Some of them were for lemurs. Some of them were from other monkeys. Okay, and we wanted to see if we recover the what we know about how the shape is changing in terms of evolution. Okay, so so this is a pair of never pronounce it, periconid, right? It's a bump on the molar, OK? And we know that as, as you get evolutionally further, it changes, OK? And so what we ask is, if I compare this one to this one, this one to the third one up, this one to the fourth one up, how different or similar are they? What's our measure of evidence, OK? And that's what the picture is. So the tarsus for the samiri, red is bigger, right? You don't see that much evidence against it. Those are the ones that are evolutionarily the closest. And then as you get further and further, you get evidence for the periconid being different. OK? So I will now end. If you think about this, all we're doing is signal processing in 3D. We're doing signal processing in 3D, except for doing the standard way of signal processing, which is using uh, like Riemann and Lebesgue integration. We're using Euler integration. So you could localize these. You can, there's a lot of rich kind of signal processing tricks you can do. You can do dictionary learning. We're putting this together with deep learning to see what we get. Um, classically, when people have looked at shapes and try to build phylogenetic models, they've had no null models. 
and this gives drives me nuts, probably drives someone like Scott nuts as well, because you know everyone says everything's adaptive, and um, and it's not. We know that it's not right. So we have now given a way of thinking about likelihoods in this space. What we don't have is how to think about what's a substitution. How do I think about a substitution from one shape to another shape? Um, there are interesting things about statistical and quantitative genetics with shape traits. We're working on gener generating distributions of shapes, so using these ideas to make uh, to have a generative model for random shapes. And lastly, I, I'm doing this probably just because I'm a masochist, but we're working on Edo calculus without parallel transport, and probably no one cares. There are people who talk to us, and there are people who gave us money, and thank you. So we have time for a couple questions, and then I'd like to ask uh, our next speaker to come up. Just let me. Scott. There is. Uh, that's we are working on that. That's what I was hinting at in terms of the um, what was it called? In terms of. Uh, the signal processing approach, because I'm sweeping through the entire shape, right? So if I only swept through parts of it, right, that would be your multi-scale approach. And if you want to do partial matchings, that's what you have to do. I just, we haven't gotten the code working. If I had more time and more students, maybe. But yeah, we, we are working on it. I had a question. Can I ask it? Yeah. OK, so for the tumor prediction, did you use anything other than the shape of the tumor? Did you use the treatment that the patient was getting to help you do prediction? Or did you, do the, did you use the age of the patient or other characteristics? So in this case, we compared gene expression to, um, to shape, right? Uh, you could use other characteristics. They would certainly, some of the clinical characteristics would do better. Right? Uh, I think the real interesting question is, how do you combine them? Yeah, that's right? what I'm asking. Which is, uh, which is, we are working on that and thinking about that. So, th th so this is a real application. The real application of this is a person goes in, they have a tumor, right? Let's say it's a glioblastoma. They get surgery. Part of it gets resected, right? And um, going back and doing something invasive is pretty hard, right? So one question, so the real question is, can you use imaging technologies to figure out when you flag them and then, you know, do something more invasive? So that's, but I'm not comfortable saying we're there yet because we're not. Yeah, hi, uh, you showed an example of fly wings as pairs of objects that weren't homeomorphic, but the uh, sorts of meshes you deal with, teeth, heel bones, look like they, in general, are going to be homeomorphic to each other. Uh, and are there interest, so my question is, are there interesting data sets where you really don't have homeomorphism, and so a diffeomorphic approach just won't work yes. without a lot of tweaking? That's a, that's a great question. So I have a colleague. She's at the uh, Natural uh, History Museum in London. And she has 700, no, 900 CT scans of skulls, from elephants to crocodiles to birds. And these are not homeomorphic at all. Right, because um, some of them are broken, like they have extra, you know, what are the tusks and things, right? So, so th that's a case where, where they're not, right? I agree, the pictures I showed you, they effectively are, uh, but, but those are cases where they're not. And what we're doing there is we're ap applying these types of approaches, we're getting these distances, and then we're making these uh, phylogenetic trees from them and seeing if there's any kind of interesting macroevolutionary questions or, or ideas that you can get from that kind of exploratory data analysis. Okay, so let's take the rest of the questions offline and let's thank Diane for a wonderful talk.